Well, Fresh Wind, we have an incredible privilege to welcome up David Slyker. If you can join me in giving him a big Fresh Wind welcome. Thank you. I love you guys. You're one of the best groups in the Western Hemisphere to preach to. <clears throat> You're just ready for anything. I appreciate that. Let's, uh, <laughs> I always love that person. I love that person. There's the person that's ready for anything, and then there's the other person that's going to make it happen. Woo! It's that person. It's the person that will hallelujah and woo all night long until it happens. Don't be that person. <laughs> Just take a pause on that. Do that during the DJ time. Jonathan will love it. Okay. Let's pray together. Do me a favor. Just put your hands on your heart all over the room if you want to. Heavenly Father, I'm asking that you would increase the spirit of prophecy in this room tonight. I'm asking that you would speak right to our hearts. I'm asking, God, that you would do what weak words cannot. God, I'm asking for a holy moment. I'm asking that you would stir hearts across this room to a holy calling. I'm asking, God, for those that will preach the riches of the excellency of the beauty of Christ. I'm asking, God, that you would mark preachers of Jesus in this room tonight, that you would mark preachers, that you would mark their heart. God, I'm asking for speakers and messengers and artists. I'm asking those that you would brand the beauty of your son on their heart like they've never known. I'm asking, God, for dreams and visions. I'm asking that your scripture, your word, would open up like never before. God, I'm asking that there would be a marking and a release of grace tonight for messengers across this room, that they would proclaim the beauty of Jesus, that hearts would be cut in two like Pentecost. I'm asking, God, like Acts chapter 2 when Peter preached, that hearts would be cut in two. To the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the anointing, and the fire of the beauty of Jesus marking a generation. God, raise up proclaimers of the beauty of Jesus from this room in Jesus' name. Amen. I feel like there's been a theme this whole conference. I feel like the Lord's been speaking. If you have ears to hear, the from every sermon, the, the thread has been very similar. If I can summarize it in Slyker language, the theme that I'm picking up is get over yourself, get a hold of God, and see what happens. That's the theme I'm hearing. It's not about you. That's the theme I, I'm hearing. It's every message throughout the worship time. That would be my summary of what I think the Holy Spirit is saying to you this weekend. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not even, no offense, it's not even about your calling. Like that prayer just now isn't about you. The prayer is about the desperation of the situation in my nation. I don't know about Canada, but America, when it's Trump versus Hillary, we need something. <laughs> we need something. And we need something more than great solutions for our economy. We need something more than great solutions to, to make our nation safer. I feel like everybody's dabbling at the edges of non-solutions. And, and David in the psalm said this, Psalm chapter 12, verse 1, he said, Help, Lord. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases and the faithful one disappears from the land. But in light of our problem, and I want to make sure that we're clear about our problem. Our problem is not that the economy is not working. Our problem is not that the military needs strengthening. I want to say this. Our problem is something greater than moral corruption. Our problem is something greater than people are sinning more. That's a problem, but there's a greater problem. The reason that people are sinning more is because the church is preaching on Jesus less.
We have to, we have to give a generation the Holy One if we want them to have an encounter with holiness that causes them to sin less. We can't tell people to sin less until they encounter the Holy One and get a vision for holiness from the blazing fire in His eyes of love and affection and zeal and jealousy and fire for their purity and their future. We have to encounter the pure one if we want a vision for purity. We have to encounter the Holy One if we want a vision for holiness. We have to encounter the jealous one if we want a vision to go as far as love can take us and a vision to go as far as the grace of God can take us. That's what we need in America more than anything else. We need missionaries that are burning with the zeal and the jealousy and the power and the authority and the anointing and the fascination and the delight and the joy and the happiness and the glory and the trembling and the fear of the Lord. We need missionaries. America needs missionaries. And America needs missionaries that are preaching something more than morality and do better. We need something more than a five-step plan to be a better leader. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And the problem is, as the godly man is ceasing, we're looking to strong men for solutions. We don't need strong men with clever solutions. We need preachers that can preach the beauty of Jesus. We need preachers that can preach Jesus like they actually know him. We need preachers that can preach Jesus as if they've actually met the man from Nazareth. They've looked into his fiery eyes. They understand how he loves. They understand how he leads. They have a confidence in being loved, but they know that it's not about them. They're wrapped up in the beauty of who he is, and they can't stop talking about him. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. That's what I'm longing for tonight. I'm longing for the fruit of this conference to be preachers that actually know stuff about Jesus. They can actually talk about him like he's a real man. They can actually talk about details related to who he is. They can talk about details related to who he is because to them, and that's the kind of preacher that the Lord's going to fill the earth with, to them, He's not just an idea. He's not just a concept. He's not just a Sunday school lesson. He's not just a sermon they heard that one time. He doesn't look like their dad. He doesn't look like or sound like their favorite preacher. He is other than and beyond and fire and glory. He is beauty. He is light. He is power. He is joy. He is unlike anything we've ever encountered before. And he wants you to know everything about him. And he wants you to tell the world about him, the man Jesus, the Jewish man from Nazareth, who's burned to be more than your friend. He's burning to be more than a comforter. He's burning to do more than make you feel good about yourself. He's burning to do more than make you feel like a whole person. I feel like sometimes we major on Jesus, the psychologist, when really Jesus, the burning bridegroom king who's coming with flaming fire of glory, he wants to do more than make you feel good about your time this weekend. He wants to capture your imagination. He wants to consume your heart. He wants to to consume the whole of your understanding. He wants obsession. He wants you absolutely consumed where you can't stop thinking about him, where he's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning. He's the last thing on your mind when you go to bed. And in the spaces of your day, all you can do is think about and talk about and feel the power of who that man is. Jesus is more than your self-help strategy to do life a little better. He is that too. But if that's all he ever is, you're missing out on the eternal one. He is a friend. He is a father. But he is a thousand things more. We've been content to scratch at the surface of barely knowing who he is just enough so we feel a little better about today. And there's a hurting world that's longing for the real deal, the missionary preacher with fire on their words because they know the man. 2 Corinthians. Paul says in chapter 3, you love this verse. Doesn't mean what you think it does. Chapter 3, verse 17, it says, now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty. Doesn't mean what you think it does. Doesn't mean liberty to be weird. Though you can be weird. 
But it's because you're weird, not because the Lord's weird. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The liberty that Paul's talking about, he's about to tell us in the next verses, it's the liberty to be free of everything that hinders, distracts, divides, despairs, depresses, and it comes between us and being consumed with the beauty of Jesus. Everything that stands between you and the consuming fire of His love, the consuming knowledge of Him, the holy obsession where you can't get enough, the absolute beautiful holy addiction of you've touched a little bit of Jesus and you can't live unless you have a little more. Leonard Ravenhill said it famously. He said it famously in his book, Why Revival Tarries. He answers the question close to the beginning. Revival tarries because we can live without it. We're content to live without it. That's the thing about God. That's the thing about Jesus. That's the scary thing about free will and the dignity that He gives each and every one of you in this room, the, the value that He has of you, the importance, the, the, how important you are to Him. The scary thing about Jesus is He lets you decide how much of God you want in your life. And if you can live without God, you will. But if you can't live without God, you won't. Matthew 7, 7, if you ask, He's going to answer you. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open to you. But I've found so many so easily distracted. They knock, and it's like, knock 43. Jesus is going to blow that door wide open and blow your world wide open and blow your mind wide open. But so many are done knocking at knock 42, and they're thinking, okay, I've done this prayer thing. I've done this Bible thing. I just... How come everybody else gets to experience Jesus and I don't? See, the thing is, it's not about going to the conference and experiencing Jesus. It's about how much of God can you live without and how much can you not live without. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, which means that the door is wide open for you to have as much of Jesus in your life and to know as much of Jesus and to experience as much of Jesus and to be wowed and blown out of the water by as much of Jesus as you want. But if you are okay with less of Jesus, then that's what you will have. I I, I meet so many teenagers They're a mile away from the bonfire wondering why they can't feel God, and they're offended at the bonfire. It's like, no, just walk a mile. Get close to the bonfire. Don't blame the bonfire for not feeling heat. We're a mile away wondering wondering what's going on. Paul says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's a wide open way. (coughs) How wide open? What's the liberty that Paul's talking about? Again, he's talking about more than freedom in a worship service. What's the liberty he's talking about? But we all, with unveiled face, unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. With an unveiled face. And again, the point is Moses was 80 days on a mountain with the glory of the Lord. Paul has just talked about earlier in the passage the glory of the old covenant. The farthest a man could go without the cross, without the blood of Jesus, without the indwelling Holy Spirit. How far can a man go in pursuing God without the cross? And Paul tells us, he goes, the glory of the old covenant is that Moses could get to a mountaintop with God. And God... Could, pa- could p- just pass by him, but it wasn't time for him to see God in all of his glory unveiled yet. It wasn't time. I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. What would it have been like if God could have answered Moses? Because it's a real famous story. Paul's quoting the story in Exodus where Moses has just seen the parting of the Red Sea Moses has just seen miracle after miracle, judgment after judgment, shaking after shaking. He's seen God move in unprecedented power. There's there's nothing like what Moses saw God do with his own eyes to Egypt and for his people. And yet, Moses on the mountain looks at God the Father and says, God, show me your glory. And we go, wait, what? What? Moses, you just saw miracles unlike anything a human being has ever seen. To this day, a human being hasn't seen miracles like Moses did. 
We think of glory as power, and nobody saw power like Moses. We think of glory as feeling the Holy Spirit. I promise you, you felt the power of God as He is moving in power to part the sea. So when Moses says, show me your glory, what's he asking? He's saying this. He's saying, God, I've seen you move. I've I've seen your power. I've seen you do stuff. But here's the thing. I know there's more to who you are than what I've seen. I know there's more at the very core of your being, at the core of your heart, at the center of your throne, at the center of the universe. I know there's more than what I've seen. I want to know who you really are. I want to see as with my own eyes. I want to see who you really are, and I want to see what you're really like. And what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3 is that Moses had gone as far as he could go. It wasn't time yet. The faces still had to be veiled. You couldn't see God at that time. But if he could have, Paul tells us in this passage, if he could have, if if God said, you know what, Moses, great question. I'm going to let you see who I really am. I'm going to let you see what I'm really like. I'm going to show you the core of my being, the essence of who I am. And Moses would have went, whoa. Because what would have happened is Moses would have stepped back in shock as the nuclear whirlwind of fire and smoke and glory and light called Revelation 4, the throne room of God, Daniel 7, the throne room of God, Ezekiel 1, the throne room of God, fire and glory, real fire, real smoke, light and sound and power coming out of the whirlwind like a, think about a nuclear tornado on glory fire times a billion, and that's what Moses would have seen if God said, okay. And he would have stared into it, and all of a sudden, the smoke would have parted, and the light would part like a curtain. That's what it says in Psalm 103. The light would have parted like a curtain, and the fragrance and the power and all of it out of the whirlwind and out of the light and out of the fire and out of the smoke would have stepped Jesus of Nazareth, dressed in a towel, the garment of a servant. And he would have knelt at the feet of Moses and he would have washed his feet right on that mountain. What do you do when you encounter the God of the whirlwind and he comes out dressed like a butler and he washes your feet? It's Easter weekend. We don't serve a gigantic strapping conqueror. We serve a God who's so happy to come out of the whirlwind and kneel down at your feet and wash them. And it's It's not what you think. You wouldn't necessarily feel the rapturous love of his affection. You would mostly feel like Peter felt, an unworthy wretch. I am not worth. The God of the universe is kneeling before me, washing my feet like a servant. Oh, I'm I'm unclean. Get away from me. But what did Jesus say? If you don't let me do this, Peter, you can have no part in me. If you don't let me serve you, if you don't let me be who I am at the core of my being, at the core of my being, I'm more than somebody that's over the earth grumpy. I'm more than somebody that, that, is, that is angry and frustrated. I'm not any of those things. Who I am at the core of my being for billions and trillions of years to come, at the, the very essence of who I am is the servant of all. It's my favorite title, the servant of servants, the lowly one, the the humble one, the one who considered equality with God something to be grasped, and yet it was nothing to him to lower himself, to come impossibly low, to come impossibly near to you and wash your feet with his blood. It's who he is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's not liberty to enjoy the worship service. It's liberty to encounter the beauty of someone that lowly, that meek, that humble, that beautiful, that incredible, that worthy of all our life, worthy of all of our hearts, worthy of all our soul, worthy of every thought we have, worthy of all of our strength and all of our resource. He's worthy of everything that's inside of us, fully given. 
Because he gave everything that was in him for us. Paul says, with unveiled face, unlike Moses, with unveiled face, we get to see Jesus. With unveiled face, with full access, with no veil and nothing in between, with nothing hindering us, we get to go as deep and as far into the beauty of someone that generous and someone that kind and someone that amazingly tender and humble and lowly. He considers equality with God something to be grasped. Yet Paul said he considers you better than himself. He considers you better than himself. He thought it more important to come down and save you and be with you forever than to be in heaven with light as a garment and the beauty of the throne room and the court of angels. He gave up all of that because he considered you better than his own comfort. He considered you better than his own honor. He considered you better, worth it in other words. He considered you to be worth the sacrifice of the riches of heaven and the glory of his throne. He gave it all up to come down in the dirt and the dust and the frustration and the misunderstanding. The confusion and the accusation and the rumors. Can you imagine the God of the universe who made heaven and earth? Peter says he upholds all things by his word. We exist because he wants us to, and yet the, because we, we exist because he wants us to, and he lived with the reputation of being an illegitimate son. His village told rumors about him behind his back. We're going, Jesus, you sat at the right hand of the Father with uncountable riches and glory and light. You had the heavens like a garment and a curtain you could part. You had it all. And you willingly and joyfully took on nothing. And more worse than nothing, it's not just that you lost everything. You entered into a town that was going to talk about you behind your back all the days of your life. <clears throat> he willingly and joyfully took on scandal and embarrassment and shame because he considered you better. That's not to emotionally motivate you to love Jesus more. I'm just wanting us to stop and go, what kind of a God does that? What kind of a God are we actually serving here? Because we've manufactured this God to the best of our ability, from we've pieced them together from a few sermons we've heard. But let me tell you something. You could be, just so you don't feel bad, you could be out of this sermon. You could go to Bible school, seminary, get your doctorate. You could spend the rest of your life, every waking moment. You could get up at 6 a.m., go to bed at midnight, spend every minute studying Jesus, studying what the Bible says about Jesus, talking to the Holy Spirit about Jesus, learning about Jesus. An angel could come from heaven and instruct you about Jesus for the next 60 years of your life. And when you meet him face to face in the age to come, you're still in for the shock of your life. You will look at him and go, who are you? I barely know you. And he'll smile at you with that humble smile. And he'll look at you with those tender eyes that also happen to be flaming with fire of jealousy. You'll look in the eyes and you'll be a little unsettled because he looks so tender and he looks like he loves you so much and yet the eyes are actually fire. It's a little confusing. You'll look at him in the eyes and, and he'll look at you with that smile and he'll go, I know it feels like you barely know me. You do. But it's okay. We've got trillions of years to search out who I am. And a trillion years from now and a trillion years beyond, you'll find out something new about Jesus and you won't even get it. You'll go, how is it possible? How is it possible that I've been learning about this man with no sin in a resurrected body with the full glory of the Holy Spirit exploding from within me, connecting me to the Word and to truth with a constant download of understanding from Him? We've been doing this for trillions of years and I'm still being blown away by new things every day. How is this possible? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty to meet that man. There's liberty to encounter and meet and know that man. He says, he says, <coughs> therefore, since we have this ministry, chapter 4, verse 1, we've received mercy. 
It's mercy that he came down. It's mercy that he removed the veil. It's mercy that we get to have this life. It's a joke I have with my kids all the time. That my poor kids, you would not want to be my kid. You know, they complain, they have a hard day, they struggle. I'll always look at them because I'm predictable dad with my dad jokes. I go right to granddad jokes now. I'm just, just getting there early. They have a hard day. They complain. I look at them every time. I go, wow. The, persecu- the persecuted underground Chinese church weeps for you right now. I let mom hug him. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Verse 3. Verse 3, but but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Here's the challenge. Here's why we need Jesus preachers with power on their life. Here's why we need Jesus preachers that know the man and have authority to actually talk about him like they know him. And when they do, the Holy Spirit moves in power. Here's why. Because the minds of the perishing, the the God of this age has blinded, the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's in the image of God, should shine on them. The light of the glory of the truth, the light of the glory of the good news. In other words, when you preach Jesus, when you preach the man as he's described in the Bible, in a way you've experienced with power and you know him. When you preach from that knowing, from connecting with the Holy Spirit and you know him, when you preach from that knowing with authority, light from heaven, light on the gospel, light shines from heaven on their minds that they might know Jesus, that they might see him in his glory, but the problem is, as you're preaching and light is shining, the God of this age is veiling that the light could not penetrate. That is where you were before you knew Jesus, when you were in darkness. There was a veil over your understanding. There was something blocking you. It's why when you talk to your friends about Jesus, They look at you like you have three heads and you don't know what you're talking about. It's not just that they don't understand you. It's not actually that they don't like you. We're so afraid of being rejected, we don't really know what's going on. It's not about you. When you talk to them about Jesus, they don't understand because the God of this age has put a blocker, a veil, a curtain over their understanding and light is hitting your friends when you talk about Jesus. The weakest one here who's in the most compromise, struggling and wanting to love Jesus but failing daily, when you get up in the morning, go to school, and tell your friend while you're so frustrated with yourself, you look over at your friend, you tell him about Jesus, boom, light is shining on your friend right then. Power and light is hitting their understanding, but the God of this age is veiling. He's he's put a curtain over their mind. They can't see. They can't see. Who's the image of God that he should shine on them? I'm going to skip a verse for a second. I'm going to go to verse 6 for a second. For it is God. It is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Mercy, Paul said at the beginning of the chapter. It was mercy that somehow, some way, somebody was praying for you. And as somebody was praying for you, that light that shone one day, it broke through the veil that the God of of this age had put over your understanding. It broke through the veil, and and God, when you got saved, it was because God commanded light. He said over your life, it's not just Genesis 1, it's every person in here who got saved. In Genesis 1, the earth was veiled. The earth was in darkness, and God, the the God of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let me tell you how it works just for fun. God the Father desired. Jesus, the Word, spoke, and when He spoke, the Holy Spirit moved with power at the sound of His voice. And what did that voice speak? According to the Father's desire, let 
there be light. Boom. If you read Genesis 1, there's no sun yet. The sun had not been created. God the Father goes, why do I need to wait for the sun to be made? Let there be light. Boom. Suddenly the earth is filled with light. Here's what's amazing. God the Father desires. God the Son speaks. God the Holy Spirit moves in power. And now you, you, the day that you were born again, how did it happen? God the Father looked at you. Somebody prayed for you and God answered. And he said, let there be light. And boom, light hits your understanding. God the Father desired that light would light your light up your life. That light would light up your understanding. God the Son, Jesus, spoke, let there be light. And God the Holy Spirit moved in power on your life. The veil was removed, and boom, you saw Jesus. Do you know how it works now? Do you know how it works now? Now, when you read the Bible, you start connecting to God the Father's desires. You start realizing the Holy Spirit's in me. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Now, when God the Father desires, I speak. Jesus said, anything that you want, ask for it in my name, and the Father will give it to you. In other words, the way that the earth was made, God desired. The Son spoke. The Holy Spirit moved in power. You, when He said, let there be light, were apprehended by the truth. The Holy Spirit filled your being, and now you've been joined with Christ. And now, when the God of the universe, when God the Father desires, you go, let it be, and the Holy Spirit moves in power at the sound of your voice. Come on. That's what you've been brought into. Come on. That's crazy. The Father desires. You don't even need to feel the Lord. You just need to know that the Bible says that healing is of the Lord. So therefore, you know God desires to heal. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Boom, the Holy Spirit moves in power. You come up to somebody that's demonized, you don't need to feel if God wants it. You know from the Word. God desires freedom. You go, be free in the name of Jesus. Boom, the Holy Spirit moves in power. This is crazy. How crazy is this? The God of the universe came and washed your feet with his tears of joy that he would be with you forever because he's a servant and you get to know him. You get to see him. Light, is hit, light hits your understanding. You know him because he shone light on your life. And now that the light is on in your life, you know what he desires and you can speak and the Holy Spirit moves in power when you pray according to the Father's will. James 4. What is this? Therefore, Paul says, therefore, in light of yesterday morning's sermon, in light of the perilous times in the last days when men will be lovers of themselves and they'll build a world about themselves and they'll preach themselves, they'll preach a message of themselves, they'll preach a message of personal greatness and achievement and giftedness. They'll do whatever they can do to get noticed and get people to pay attention to them. They'll do whatever they can do to capture and hold your attention. Therefore, in the last days, when men are lovers of themselves, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5? For those that have encountered the light of glory, they now see the truth by the grace of God. They can't go back. They've met the servant. They're undone. They speak and things happen because God moves when they speak. They don't even know what they've gotten into, but they're captured and their imagination's on fire. And 2 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, therefore... We no longer preach ourselves. We can't. We can no longer preach ourselves. Oh, I see it across the church. I see insecure people that are longing to be loved, preaching themselves. I see unstable people that are longing to be whole, that haven't met Jesus, 
but they've encountered enough of Jesus to be saved, but they don't know him enough to be stable, and they're preaching themselves, hoping not to be rejected. Then there are others who've been seduced by a world that preaches love of self, and they join right into the chorus, and they preach themselves. That is not who you are. That is not who's in this room. The Lord's been shouting it all weekend. In this room are missionaries. In this room are messengers. In this room are proclaimers of the beauty of Jesus. In this room are people that are destined to be marked by the Holy Spirit to never preach themselves again. Oh, the days are coming. You don't need a business card and a poster. You need three verses about Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and a captured lovesick heart. Let me tell you something. I'm just, I'm looking for a certain kind of person here tonight. I'm looking for the kind of person that sees the emptiness of the worship of self, the kind of person that's over themselves. They are over themselves. They're not that impressed with themselves. I talked about yesterday morning that the gospel would make you unimpressed with everybody else, tender towards them, but unimpressed. Remember what I said? Hey, I met so-and-so. Wow, favor. No, 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 no. That person you met that's super popular on Instagram, didn't put his spirit in you, doesn't uphold their world by his word. <laughs> that person who you met that shone light in your life, that upholds the world by his word, put the fullness of a spirit in you. It's making a diamond city for you to live forever. Be impressed by him. And once you're impressed by him, everyone else is radically unimpressive. So yesterday's sermon was about getting over a culture that can't get over itself. Tonight is about getting over yourself. I, there's so many sweet, Jesus loves you and your awesome sermons to preach. I just felt so burdened tonight. There's something more for you. There's someone more for you, and there's someone that wants to escort you into more if you want it, and he wants to escort you into more. It's not so that you have a less boring Christianity or a less boring Christian life or that you get to go to exciting places and do cool things. It's because you're captured. It's because you're pierced. It's because you're undone. It's because you've met him, and you can't preach yourself. Therefore, I can no longer preach myself. Who am I? I get that he's all about me. I get that he loves me fully. I get that he's super into me. But I also get who I really am. Weak, broken. Don't speak that negative confession over yourself, Dave. No, I'm weak and broken. It's okay. I don't have shame about it. <laughs> I'm not wallowing in pity. I get how messed up I am. I'm not going to wallow. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I am unimpressive. He is super, super filled with love for me. But that's about him, not about how awesome I am. That's about how amazing he is at loving, not how amazingly lovable I am. And sometimes that's our takeaway from these messages. We feel so lovable. That is not the point. The point is, I am absolutely a mess, and he is so fully committed to my future with zero nervousness and anxiety. <laughs> been saying this a lot lately, but it's hard for us to fathom. It's hard for us to understand. How can God not be angry in my struggle and my sin and my compromise? How can He not be angry? The Lord, the Lord looks at us. Jesus looks at us with such, just that knowing joy that doesn't look like goofiness. It looks like the, I know something you don't know, but that's okay. You're going to know it in a second. And he says, look, here's the thing. Here's why you get angry when you stumble. Here's why you get angry when you blow it. Here's why you feel so disqualified and so ashamed. You feel so angry because you feel powerless and you feel stuck. And it makes you angry. You don't want to feel powerless and you don't want to feel stuck. You get so angry and you don't see any way out. And you look at the Lord 
And you're sure he's angry too. And he's looking at you, and he has this knowing smile. And you're going, how can this be? I know that you're not okay with my sin, and I know that you're not okay with my compromise. How can you be so calm? He goes, oh, you're made in my image, but I'm nothing like you. See, when you sin and stumble, you feel stuck because you feel powerless. I can't relate with that feeling. I'm not powerless. I'm not nervous. I'm not anxious about your future. I'm not wondering how you're going to get through this. I'm not at a distance waiting for you to get your act together. I put my spirit in you, which means we're in this together. I'm not at a distance trying to tell you to get, get it going. I'm in you. I'm in this with you. We'll get through this together. We'll get through this together. I'm with you in this till the end, and you don't get a vote related to my commitment and my loyalty. He's not just a servant. He is annoyingly loyal. No matter how much, I mean, you can be the biggest fake rebel in here, and you're just a fake rebel. You're just a hurting kid pretending to have an attitude. You are not a rebel. If you want to think you're a rebel, then stop dressing like everybody else. You can do your fake rebel attitude and pretend that you're Mr. Cool and do whatever you want. He is annoyingly loyal to you. He clings to you uh, with fierce determination. And every time, here's the thing about sin. It's not like Jesus goes somewhere else when you sin. No, the horror is he's right there with a smile. I'm still clinging to you. Jesus, I'm in the middle of sinning right now. He goes, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, this is horrible. He goes, I know. When you meet a God like that, when you meet someone that humble, that glorious, that merciful, that tender, that amazing, that beautiful, that fiery, that committed, that loyal, that fierce, that stubborn determination that he's getting you through this and you don't get a vote, you're going, I feel stuck. He goes, it's only a matter of time. I'm really good at what I do. I'm really good at this thing called delivering you into more love. I'm the best there is in the universe. You just sit tight. I'm working on this. I've got a solution. It's called me. (laughs) For we do not preach ourselves. Therefore, when you encounter a God like that, but we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, we're bond slaves. Ourselves, bond slave means slave of love. We're a, we're a slave of love. I'm a willing, voluntary slave. I, I can't, I don't have any choice. He's loved me so well. He's loved me so perfectly. He's fought for me. He fights for me right now. No one's for me like he is. He serves me. He helps me. He speaks to me. He shines light. He moves in power. I, I can't escape it. He's everywhere, and he's for me, and he's fierce, and he's chasing me down from the inside. It's not like he's coming from somewhere else running after me. He chases me down from the inside. What do we do? Therefore, I'm a bond slave. I'm in. Who's in tonight? No, 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 no. No, I don't want a hype session. I want a holy moment. Who's in? I don't want you to shout at me. I want you to take a second. Don't talk to me. Take a second and think about the Jesus I've been telling you about. Think about him, fiery, jealous eyes, committed to you till the end to serve you into greatness because you're worth it to him. Who's in? Who's in for the nations? Who's in to preach Jesus? Who's in to preach even if they hate you, even if they reject you, even if they're not for you? See, who's in? The reason that I don't want you to yell at me is because it's easy to get you fired up at a conference, but when you start preaching Jesus and you preach your way into loneliness and you preach your way into rejection, and you preach your way into real suffering and pain, when you preach your way into the hatred and the contempt of people that used to be your friends, the conference speaker's miles away. That conference moment is long gone. It's you, Jesus, and loneliness, and the cost of what you say tonight. 
If you can't preach yourself, you have no choice. If you're a bond slave, you have no choice. You got to stare loneliness in the eye and you got to say, you know what? It's not like I have a choice. I'm marked for the nations, I'm marked for my generation. I'm marked to preach Jesus. I have no choice. There's no turning back. Whatever it costs me, whatever it costs. What I'm longing for tonight is the whatever it costs group. What I'm longing for tonight isn't the shouting crowd. I'm longing for the crowd that says whatever it costs, whatever it takes. I don't want to be a pampered generation that gets offended when someone looks at me funny. I want to be the generation that gives my life for the beauty of Jesus. I want to be the one that lays it down. I want to be the one that pours it out. He poured himself out for me. I want to be the one that sacrifices. I want to be the one that's willing to be hurt. I want to be the one that's willing to go where others don't. I want to be the one that's willing to say with humility, with tenderness, with mercy, but I want to be the one that's willing to say what others aren't willing to say. Courage. This generation needs courage. This generation, Christless without the knowledge of God, filled with fear, easily offended, pampered, complaining, entitled. God, in His mercy and a tenderness towards them, has a solution, and it's you, with courage, willing to lay it all down. They might hate you at first, but they'll thank you forever. Who is wanting to do more then get a little prayer at the altar. Who's wanting to give their life to preach the beauty of Jesus? If that's you, I just want you to stand right where you are, saying, I want to I give my life to this. I want to go to the nations. I want to be a missionary. I want to be a messenger. I want to be one that speaks His name. Hearts are cut in two. I want to be one that talks like I know Him. Let's have the worship team come on up. If you stood because of peer pressure, <laughs> you can sit right back down and I'll think you're the coolest kid in the room. I really will. This isn't the everybody respond altar call. This is the I want to give my life to preaching the beauty of Jesus. Wherever I go, whatever job I have, this isn't about ministry. This isn't about I'm going to be a pastor someday. You can be an accountant. You can be a tax specialist. And at your workplace, you can't shut up about the beauty of Jesus. I don't care about your job. I don't care about your income. I, I care about that you're marked as a missionary and a messenger to preach His beauty wherever you go. And you want to pay the price. You want to give it all. Just all over the room, as that's you, just close your eyes and lift your hands for a moment. For real, somebody get that worship team. I'm going to run out of things to say in about 30 seconds. Holy Spirit, I'm asking, all over this room, I want to encourage you, don't, don't be cultural right now. And by cultural, I mean don't scream because it's what you do at a youth conference. Don't shout because it's what you do in Toronto. If the Lord's moving on you, you go with it. But don't be cultural right now. Let the Lord minister to you for a minute. I want the Lord to do something in your heart that lasts for decades, not minutes. It's so Holy Spirit, I'm asking, all over this room, mark hearts and fire all over this room. I'm asking for fire from the Holy Spirit. Release fire on hearts all over this room. Fire, I'm asking for the spirit of burning. I'm asking that you would mark messengers of Jesus. Mark preachers of the beauty of Jesus all over this room. God, I'm asking that your sovereign hand that your hand of glory would rest upon different ones right now all over this room. I'm asking, Lord, capture us. Capture us with your beauty. Capture us with your glory. Right now, release fire. Release fire. Just a few of you, if you want, just put your hands over your eyes. God, I'm asking. We want to see Jesus. Open up our eyes. The eyes of our understanding. We want to see Him. We want to see Him. We want to see Him in new ways. 
We want to see his glory, his light, his beauty. We want to see his tenderness, his servant-heartedness. We want to see his zeal, his jealousy. We want to see his commitment. We want to see his fierceness. We want to see his mercy, his tenderness. We want to see the way that he looks at me. We want to see God the way that he looks at us in our worst day and on our best. We want to see that expression of joy on his face. We want to see that, that look of absolute authority with absolute peace, with absolute joy, with absolute jealousy. We want to see what that looks like on a man's face. We want to see him, God. You said unveiled face. You said we could see what Moses couldn't. I'm asking all over this room, show us Jesus. Show us Jesus. We want more. We want more. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you've done in our hearts and our lives. God, we want more. We want more. We want to be the ones that can't live without more of your son. We want to be the ones that can't live without more of your beauty and your glory. So I'm asking, Lord, because So I pray for a few of you right now. As I've been preaching, your heart has been burning, but in a very specific way. You know that this message I preach tonight, you're called to preach it in some of the hardest and darkest places on the earth. Closed nations that others can't get into, you feel a grace in your life to get in, to preach Jesus. Jesus. You feel called to go into closed nations, hardest and darkest places on the earth. You're asking the Lord, get me in there. The places where the minds of the lost are veiled by the God of this age. There's something in you that's aching to get in. That you can't deny. There's something in you that's gripped your heart. You're saying... God, send me. I want to preach the beauty of Jesus to the Muslim world. I want to preach the beauty of Jesus in the Middle East where they've never heard. I want to preach to children that have never heard about Jesus. I want to preach to families that have never heard about Jesus. I want to preach with authority. I want to preach His beauty. 
I want to preach His worth. I want to preach His mercy. I want to preach His servant-heartedness. I want to preach a God they've never met. I want to preach a God they can't conceive of. I want to preach a God so tender, so humble, so lowly, so beautiful. I want to preach that Jesus. And the nations that have not heard, the peoples that do not know, I'm saying, here I am, God, send me tonight. Send me, God, into the closed places to preach the worth of Christ and His beauty. Here we are, Lord.
some of you as you're responding to the call tonight. You're feeling that loneliness of the calling. You're feeling the loneliness that's in front of you. Jesus answered that in the Great Commission. He said, if you would go into all nations, teaching them all things that I've commanded, baptizing them in water and in spirit, he said, lo, I will be with you. I will be with you. The Lord has grace tonight for those that are answering the call. You want to go to the nations. You want to take the gospel to the nations. You want to take the gospel to a generation, but you feel the loneliness of it. The Lord says, I'll be with you. If you, if you teach all things I've commanded, you baptize in water, you baptize in fire, the Holy Spirit, I'll be with you, I'll be near you. You're not going alone. I'll be with you. If you're saying tonight, I want that grace. I want that grace. The nearness of God to overcome loneliness. The loneliness being radical and serious and fiery and focused for Jesus. The loneliness of saying yes to a rare and high call. You want that grace tonight. You said you'd be with me. I'm not doing this for the fame. I'm not doing this for the honor. I'm not doing this for the applause of the crowds. I'm doing this because you said you'd be with me. That's what I'm in it for. I'm in it for love. I'm in it for love, Jesus. I'm in it for you. I want to go because you're with me. If you want that grace in your life, just raise your hands all over the room. You want that grace to overcome the loneliness of what the Lord's asking of you. Lord, I'm asking, baptize us in a fresh way tonight in your love. Baptize us in a fresh way in your presence and your nearness. The beauty, God, of being loved by you. We're in this for love. We're in this for love. We're not in it for the crowds. We're in this for love. We're not in this for honor. We're in this for love. We're not in this for the applause of man. We're in this for love. Baptize us, God. Baptize us, God. Baptize us, God. Baptize us, God. Baptize us in a fresh way. Fill us with your love, your nearness, your glory, your presence in Jesus' name. you first loved us.
Are you ready to dance? All right, here we go. All right. Here we go. Are you ready? And if he goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. And if he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're gonna chomp, 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 chomp in the river. Chomp, 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 chomp. Everybody, if he goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. If he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're gonna dance, 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 dance in the river. Dance, 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 dance. Everybody, if he goes to the left. We'll go to the left, and if he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're we'll gonna jump, 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 in the red. jump, 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 jump. Everybody, if he goes to the left, then we'll go to the left, and if he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're gonna shout, 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 shout in the red.
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, 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 Lord. Come on, guys. Let's keep it going. Yes, Lord. Come on. Yes, Lord. We say yes to you. Yes to your plans. We say yes to what you desire. Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say yes. Turn to your other neighbor and say yes. The best is yet to come. Guys, we, we want to pray over you tonight. We want to have a time where we allow the Holy Spirit to just keep going and keep moving. Are you okay with that? So what we're going to do, we have a little bit of organization, but we are totally okay with Holy Spirit chaos in a good way. So what we're going to set up over the next few minutes is we're going to set up five fire tunnels. Now it's... You may never have experienced a fire tunnel before. You may have no idea what I'm talking about. It's, it's incredible. All it is, is is some of our ministry team and those that have been asked to minister are going to be standing across from each other, making a tunnel, and just allowing the Holy Spirit to move through them to touch you. That sound good? I said, does that sound good? 